This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is an online mentoring program that teaches people with no experience how to create a real profitable online business and e-commerce. I have been working with Ryan at Change for a few years now and attended many events and got to meet the amazing community of like-minded people. These guys are the best of the best. The support these guys offer is personal, no bots or employees, there's no experience needed, but like anything in life, it takes time as it's a real business with real results. For more information, go check out Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help build a successful business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. Then we're on. Today's guest, we got Ricky Lambert. Ricky boy, how are you? I'm good. I'm good, thank you. Good to see you. Nice to be on, mate. Nice to be on. Listen, great career, first of all. Liverpool boys, you started at youth team, released, yeah. in and out the lower leagues, League 2, League 1, kind of screwed the head at 27, and then bang, scoring goals for fun. England call-up, Liverpool, kind of living your dreams. Just, it's like fairy tales, that is an unbelievable story. <laughs> yeah, it's not your normal football career is it it's not it's not your average career normally it's one one or the other round league two league one for years and then or you yeah you're at the top I, i've i went from the bottom to the top but it wasn't that i just done from the bottom to the top it was how long i stayed there i think that was a little bit different about my career how long i actually stayed in the depths of uh, the the pyramid so to then finally yeah to get up was it was incredible it was incredible. Before we get into it, I always like to go back to the start of my guess. Get a bit of understanding about yeah, you, yeah. where you yeah. grew up and how it all began. Grew up in Bill, born in Kirby, yeah. Um, West Vale, Stanton Crescent, lived in my nans till I was about nine. No, my mum said it was seven, but I'm sure I was a bit older than that. Lived, yeah, lived with my nans until it was nine and then moved out to Whitefield Drive. And the Good thing about moving to Whitefield Drive, anyone from Kirby will know this, is that Kirby Sports Centre was facing it. I lived in the Masonettes facing it, so, and then an AstroTurf got got built right in front of my house. As At the time, I was moving into the in, into the house, so that has a massive part to, to, to play in my football career, but I loved it. I loved my time in Kirby. Um, it has everything because a kid. The the Kirby Sports Centre, swimming bats, it was it was it was brilliant. I, Milbrook went to Milbrook, um, again in West Vale. Still friends with all the lads who I met. Who was in my class? These about ten of us. Still very close. Um, went to and then went on to Roughwood School. Yeah, didn't um, didn't really like me teen years as much. But no, mate, I, I love Kirby. Love Kirby, Kirby. And you didn't realise what Kirby was about until till maybe you left it. But I, I wouldn't have chosen it any, any, any other way. What about mum and dad? Mum and dad. Uh, my dad was a farmer. Early days. Um, until that, that got took away from him. Um, I think... Immigration played a big part in it. Uh, obviously, paying them a lot less than me dad, so me had me dad had to to go other places. Me mum mum never really worked. I think she worked when I was young, but throughout my life she was a, a, a home mum. Yeah, amazing, amazing parents. Um, like my mum was so loving. Hey, I was speaking to the other day. Actually, I was I was she had a big part to play in my self-belief which i call now manifestation i think she was a massive part to play in that um they, they, they had no we had no money but but they 
they took they gave me everything that I needed. They gave me football. They made made sure I was at every training session, every football game. And um they was there for me. It was yeah, they were amazing. What was your first football team? Shevington Park. Yeah. What under, age? Under eight. Under eight. Yeah, my neighbour, Leon Edwards, who's still my one of my best friends, um, was playing. He was the goalkeeper, so he, he took me. So I was desperate to get involved. So I was on to me, mum and dad, I want to play football, I want to play football. I had, my, I think my dad said I had so much energy, whatever he put me in, I was going to succeed because the amount of energy I had. Um, so when, yeah, Leon took me with his dad to training session one day, I can still remember it now, I was eight. Yeah, I still remember it. I can, it was this new kid, stuff like that. And from that day, mate, I just just fell in love with football. Striker? Yes, yes. I had a good kick. Because you're a big lad now. Were you a big yes, boy then at yes, eight, nine? Yes, I was. I was not, not, not so much at eight, but 10, 11, I was much bigger, much faster, much stronger than, than everyone else. But my main difference to everyone was my right foot. I could kick it like a, a fella. At about ten. So, did you start getting the buzz for football, or we just go through the motions? Did you realise you were a player at a young age? I knew it came straight away. I was, I was better than most. Not, not like, didn't think I was unbelievable, but I, I thought I was better than most. Um, but I knew that I loved it more than anyone. Yeah. I knew that straight away. And you went to Liverpool, elevens. Ten, yeah, ten, eleven. Played in the final against Crosby Stewart in um in Ainsdale and the Liverpool scout uh Dave Shannon I think it was who picked me up sent me to trials and it was the best moment of my my life it was it was incredible obviously to get trials for Liverpool I was a massive Liverpool fan so the nerves were were there but yeah I managed to managed to get a contract so that was that was it was amazing for me mum and dad my mum and dad were over, overjoyed overjoyed yeah and you're there three four years four five years 10 to 10 to 15 first two three years loved it loved it learned so much i was obviously physically i was one of the better ones as well so i was more than capable of being a starter as 13 14 15 came and the change happened i fell well behind everyone caught up i not only did i everyone catch up i fell behind in, in the fitness and the speed and strength so all i had then which was my technical ability which all the Liverpool lads are, lads are anyway so that's when i started falling behind not playing so much and it, well it was only a matter of time before i got let go to be fair and what was that feeling getting let go <laughs> it's just it's absolutely devastating <laughs> absolutely <laughs> devastating i didn't think it would ever get worse than that ever and i don't you know what i don't even think it. i don't <laughs> all the moments i've had letdowns and knockbacks i've had in my life that was probably the, the most devastating one because i thought it was that was it that was my dream over i was gonna obviously play football but to be a professional footballer that was it that he was telling me I wasn't good enough. So to get told that by it was Steve Iwer at the time. Um, but Liverpool. It was Liverpool. It was Liverpool telling me you're good, but you're just not good for Liverpool. You're good enough for Liverpool. It was a hard pill to swallow. I went home, cried my eyes out. What made you keep going? My dad, my mum and dad. Mum and dad. My dad came up to me and said, mate, listen, proved them wrong. Proved them wrong. Um, didn't take much notice to it at first. He said, you, you, you'll go again, go again. You'll find someone else and you'll prove these wrong. And that was it. That was it. Sent me on the journey. Went straight to Blackpool because we made Danny Coyd, who was at Liverpool with me. He got let go before me, went to Blackpool. So he was already a route straight back into football. Went straight went straight to Blackpool. And that's how, that's how my um, career with Blackpool started. How was that for you? I loved it. So I done me white yes at Blackpool, 16 to 18. We lived in Blackpool with... To do two digs, two a set of eight and a set of eight round the corner from each other, so that was carnage. But it was absolutely, it was brilliant. Blackpool was a good city to grow up in at that time. Mm -hmm. Because a few of your interviews you've admitted you liked a good baby. Yeah. When did you start drinking? Um, <laughs> I can remember having my first drink with Steve Lafferty. I think I was ten or eleven. For <laughs> 
I think I drank. Do you know them old globes that people had in the houses? Yeah. I think I drank all the vodka from one of them. Me and yeah. him took turns a piece, and we just spewed everything. I think that was my first drink, and then I think I liked drink from very early on. Why do you think that is? Um, the culture of of Kirby and my family. Like I had a massive family, so it was all always get-togethers. My nan had eleven children, and all all of them came to her house. Obviously, when I was eight nine i lived there till i was eight nine so i was it was just massive get-togethers and then when we moved out it was whatever parties or and it was just drinking it was just everyone was having a good time and so i early on associated having a good time with having a drink that was my association with it and whenever there was a free bottle on the table i would go over and have a little swig when i was even like 12 13 14 and my parents would laugh at me stop me but laugh at me going have you seen him and I think the first time I got drunk was about 14. I think it was at my nan's party. I'm not sure what age she was. Yeah, I think I'd sneaked it out <laughs> enough bottles to, to get drunk or I was getting bought by my, my uncles or, or whatever. So I loved it. And then obviously I went into football. And but at that time, drink was everywhere. Drink, like the drinking schools were everywhere. Blackpool, when I went to Macclesfield, it was a Sunday club, a Tuesday club. So I loved that side. I loved that. Um, I loved that camaraderie where you would get together, have a laugh, take the piss out of each other, and say stuff that maybe that like you wouldn't say um, on a day to day basis at training. Um, what needed to be said. I loved that side of it. So I carried that going. But I, what happens is that football was massively changing. But I didn't. I carried it on, and I think. As I go on to say, that was one of my main detriments to my playing career. What happened after Blackpool? Um, again, fitness. I, I was never, I was one of the unfittest at the club. I was running with the keepers. Now, to run with the keepers was an embarrassment, but I was running behind the keepers. But my ability was there to see. Uh, so the, the word Steve McMahon, so Nigel Warrington loved me, but Steve McMahon was the one who came in and let me go. He, my idol, by the way. My dad's idol, but you ask me, my dad out what he thinks is Steve McMahon now, he won't be saying the same. Um, so we actually said the words, you've probably got the best ability in this club, but you can't do what I want you to do, so I'm going to have to let you go. They, they were the words. And I was like, I was struggling to take it in that time. And at the time, I was always blaming other people, always blaming other people. But, oh, Steve McMahon, you don't have a clue. You're wrong and this and that. It wasn't until I was older until I started looking into myself. And that's when my career truly changed. Who was it getting another rejection? Were you thinking just yeah, dev up? No, devastating. That wasn't so much a devastation because, again, I thought, you know, I'll just go on to another club, I'll find another club, and I'll prove him wrong. And that, that that was a strength throughout my career, proving people wrong, proving people wrong, proving managers who, who let me go or managers who thought I wasn't good enough. It was always proving these people wrong. So when I left Blackpool, I went to Macclesfield again. Darren Connell, who was at Blackpool, left before me, went to Macclesfield. So again, there was a route for me to go to Macclesfield. It was tough to get to Macclesfield. It's like an hour and 10. With no money, it was tough. Darren helped me for a good chunk of it. Um, but I started progressing a little bit faster than Darren. So that was with the first team. So the transport became a real big problem because I couldn't, drive didn't have any contract i was on trial for about a year and in the end i was like i can't do this no more i was working in the beetroot factory with my dad he was working on the farm i was working in the beetroot factory or i was helping him on the farm to go and get some cash 20 quid a day just to 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 get me to macclesfield um in the end i was actually involved in the first team playing on a non-contract 50 pound travel expenses so i had to go in and say i can't do it no more i'm gonna have to give up yeah football i can't afford it i'm gonna have to go and find a job and then i'll play uh part-time that was my plan and then gil prescott came to me and said we can offer you 120 quid a week to keep you on to keep you to keep you on at Macclesfield. i think it was six months later uh, they sold me for three hundred thousand pounds, and it's, to this day, it's still the record that they've ever received for a player. 
So it just shows you how, how quickly football can change if you just stick in there. But it was touch and go. It, that was probably the closest I've ever come to leaving football. What happened then after the 300 grand signing? I uh, went to Stockport. What age were you, 21? 20, 21, yeah, 20, 21. Yeah, so yeah. still a lot of money for a young kid. Yeah, then. yeah. So the pre the pressure was big. Uh, under Carl Palmer, he signed a few young, talented players, Ben Burgess. Uh, we had some good players, Kevin Elson, Aaron Wilbraham, John Daly. Um, we had some very good young players, so the squad was good. Um, but he signed me. I was playing an attack in midfielder or a winger at Macclesfield. He signed me as a defensive midfielder to try and be the quarterback because of my right foot. It didn't work out. I wasn't fit enough to do it. And my defensive ability just wasn't wasn't good enough. So I struggled at Stockport pr pretty much straight away. Where'd you go after that? Um, I lit It went that bad the last year of Stockport. So I got booed out of the club. <laughs> got absolutely <laughs> um, vilified. We all got vilified. We were bottom of the table. But I I was the captain the year before. I was playing this season. I got vilified the most. That was horrific. Horrific experience for me. Um. 22 23 it was and i couldn't wait to get out of the club so literally left for nothing for Rochdale for took me for 20 grand my i was gone by this time mentally gone mentally gone i just didn't want to be in football hated it drinking a lot yeah yeah again a lot of lads at the same age always going out um that's when when that's when i think the drinking at home started under stockport I never, I never done that. I was only go out and binge drink. And I was, a, I was a bad binge binge drinker. It's terrible, actually. That's the worst part of me, binge drinking. But at Stockport, um, the day uh, the drinking at home started just to get over like the like what had actually happened in that day, getting abused by by the fans. I just couldn't handle it. Um, couldn't go out, so I went to Rochdale under Steve Parkin just to get some feelings back yeah. and you played well at Rochdale yeah well. that's when it started to slowly turn around the the love for football came back he pushed me further up as a striker and I start that's when I started scoring goals do you start getting the love and the passion back for it yeah how big a, how big is that for any footballer anyone is to have some sort of passion and not just doing it for a wage it's everything it's everything because I think most there is mercenaries out there who play football to make money, but most most footy players that I know it play football as a kid because they loved it, because they loved it, and that now they're making money because they love football, not because they they love making money. They love playing football and the good at it, so that the money comes. So I think anyone who's successful at football has to love it, like, and I mean absolutely love it more than anything, anything. They have to become self self obsessed with it. So where did you go after? Was it Bristol Rovers? Bristol, Bristol City? Rovers. So yeah, Bristol Rovers bought me free two hundred and fifty grand. So my career was starting to pick up again. What age were you then? Twenty four. And this is League Two. League Two to another League Two team. So, but Bristol Rovers were a big club in League Two. At yeah, they've time. got a big supporter. Yes, ten thousand a match. Yes. Then is a lot. Yeah, no, them was they were massive. They were massive. So the pressure on them was to get up massively that season, but they were struggling. And I went and it, I started terribly at first. I was unfit. I got injured in pre-season for Rochdale. And it took me three, four months to catch up, but I did. And then my game really started to take off at Bristol Rovers. The fans took to me. I scored a goal against Bristol City in the final, area final of the JPT. And that turned my career around. Now, I, I, to this day, I say that was one of the most defining moments of my career, that goal for Bristol Rovers. Because they... They stuck with me, but they were on the verge of, like, getting on my back, saying, who have we signed here? So when I scored that goal, that just gave me time and I encouragement to play my normal game. They loved me. They was clapping me, started singing my name, and my game just took off from there. How much pressure's on a young kid? Say if you get signed for 300 grand, which is nothing now compared to day, today's money, but how much pressure becomes on your shoulders when you're not doing well with your career, you're drinking, you're feeling lazy, you've put on a bit of weight. Do you feel that added pressure of trying to fool people as well, where you're trying to 
pretend that you're on it when you really you know you're I, slipping? Um, I didn't. I didn't feel a pressure. I didn't feel a pressure of I'm getting paid by these fans. I need to be professional. I didn't. I just didn't. I thought I'm scoring goals. I'm doing my job. I'm doing good enough to be in this team. I don't. I'll do whatever I want. That's the way I fought. So where did you go after Bristol? That's when. So the last season of Bristol I scored 29 goals. That's when I think most people started noticing me. Even though I was scoring regularly that season, people started noticing me. And Alan Pardew obviously noticed me and um, wanted me at Charlton, but couldn't get me. And when he got let go by Charlton and Southampton took him, he come for me first. That was his first signing. And that was it, mate. That was the biggest moment of my career, going to Southampton. That's when it all changed. Because uh, when you went to Southampton, were you overweight? Yes, 16 stone. That's a big... But you're a big <laughs> lad anyway, but that's yeah. still big for a player. Yeah. What should you have been, about 14 and a half? At my peak, I was 14 and a half. And when was the moment... When you, what was that feeling like when somebody says, listen, you fat, so you, you get your ass in <laughs> and, and check? That's exactly what it was. That's exactly what it <laughs> Did was. Did your ego be dented then? Yeah, because I thought I was, um, I was I started scoring straight away. So I was on about eight goals. I was leading goal scorer in the league. So he called me in and um, he said, sit down. So I thought he was going to go, well done. How are you enjoying it? Like you're doing really well. Something like that. So when he said, come down, uh, come sit down. I sat down. He went, lift your top up. I just looked at him and said, what, what, what do you mean? And he said, lift, lift your fucking top up. So I went like that. And he went, see, that's what that's what I'm talking about. Absolute fucking disgrace, that. And I was like, whoa, what? What? <laughs> what? <laughs> and uh, the fitness coach just stood behind him, looking at him going, did you know this was coming? And uh, I went, what do you mean? He went, I've, I've been watching you about this city and about this club and the way you handle yourself is a disgrace. And the way you eat, the way you drink. I went, he said, um, you think you can do that, Southampton? You can do it at Bristol Rovers, you can do it at Rochdale, you can do it in League Two. You can't do it at Southampton. Um, I was like, right, okay. So what I want you to do, I'll give you six weeks to get that belly off or you're out of this club. So I was like, wow, wow. So... I was absolutely shook to the core. So I went out and I was like looking into the floor, looking at the physio, uh, the fitness coach, Nick Nick Harvey, thinking, what am I going to do here? Because all through my career, all my all through my career, I was like, nah, I know better. No. That was probably the first moment I went, right, I'm going to listen to him now. I'm going to listen to him. He's right. He's uh, what are you, Everything that he's just said is spot on. He, it was it was undeniable. So I said to Nick, right, what are we going to do? He went, get in for 8 o'clock tomorrow. We'll do a session before the lads get, get in for breakfast. Then you'll have breakfast with the lads. Then you'll train with the lads. Then we'll do a session afterwards. And I said, right, okay. So that's what I did. Six weeks, done it. Felt like shit. Felt like shit. Couldn't play, couldn't score. But the gaffer pulled me one time. He said, listen, I know what you're doing keep it going you'll be playing every week don't worry about it the goals will come so after four weeks four or five weeks i started to notice a little bit of difference the weight was off the muscle was on and i was already a step ahead of everyone in league one a step ahead of everyone so when i became fit i started noticing training i started noticing the games i became two steps ahead of everyone it's just it was it just became like a drug uh, like the biggest struggle that anyone's ever had and it was just I just became addicted to it and that's when my career just went like a rocket all the managers you played under why him why listen to him why listen to those words because you know yourself that conversation could have went two ways but ego think you know everything it's a case of fuck you I'll go somewhere else you've been to many teams anyway it's, it's nothing new but why him why listen Um, I think it was the creed he's had he's already had a good career at that point um, personally was but it was the way he told me I think it was the way he told me he was I think players managers coaches have tried to nicely tell me you're better than this what are you doing here what are you doing you're better than League 2 come on mate you're, you've got to do this and I, was, I I took it in but it wasn't he he made it an ultimatum to me so I had to I had to go he put it on my, my toes I had to make a decision 
and it was the way he told me. Um, so it was, it was a decision I made, and like I said, it was the I put him as the most defining coach I had in my career. And did you score thirty eight goals that season? Thirty seven. Thirty seven. Yeah. Did, was that the most you'd scored yeah. ever in a season? Yeah. And this was League One? League One. And you didn't even get promoted that year? No. We How were, hard was that to? No, we were minus 15 points. Oh. So we went into administration. So we, he got in the players, and the players that he got in were unbelievable. So we knew we were going to get close. Well, our aim was to get into the playoffs. I think we missed out by one point. And Huddersfield just kept on winning. We kept on winning and we missed out by one point. It was devastating. Absolutely devastating. But we won the JPT that year. So we kind of had the beginnings of something. We knew it. Mm -hmm. We had a core of players. We had Jose Fonte, Adam Lallana, Morgan Snydland, Kev Kelvin Davis, me, Lee Barnard. We had a core of players. Dean Hammond, core play, which was unbelievable. Like if you see where them plays went on, went, went on to play. It's unbelievable that when you think that they all play together in League One. So we all knew that we had something special. Um, so the next season came, Alan Pardew fell out with Nicola Cortese. Nicola Cortese is a character that is hard to explain. Um, Marmite, very much Marmite, but I, if I had to go either way, I appreciate him for what he did for, for me and my family, for me and my life, because he pushed us to a level that I think that we weren't ready, that we didn't think that we were level ready, but his mentality and his the way his, he, he was as, as a person um, would push us on to, to levels that, that we got to in the end, but he's a very demanding chairman. So he quickly fell out with Alan Pardew. So Alan Pardew was gone. Nigel Atkins came in. It took him a while to get used to the squad. But once he got 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 us playing, I think Nicola wants us to play football, become a total football team. And it didn't take as long to, to do that under Nigel. Once once Nigel got us playing, that was it. That was it. it was, we, he was not stopping us. Why did you all stay together when the manager went? Uh, no, we... we 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 joined for uh, Alan. Mm. Well, I think we joined for the project more. Did you see the vision of yeah. where they were going to take it? Yes. Yeah. And did you believe in it? Yes, hundred percent. The Southampton way. Because we I've always that. been a massive a massive team. Yeah. Obviously, Matt Letizzi, and he could have went anywhere in the world. What an um, world class player! So you get promoted, League One, straight into the Championship. Yeah. What was the expectations that year? Because you went straight up again. Again, our, my expectation was to to get mid table. Uh, most of the players expectation and when we were doing the, the bonuses that's what we were fighting for but we didn't the, the chairman just laughed at us saying no no you only get bonuses if you're in, in the top six and we were like you're fucking messing me like we just got you promoted now we're in the championship and you're saying we won't get any bonuses unless we're in the top six so we we were um, fuming with that but again puts a subconscious message into us Without us even knowing at the time, we hated them. I hated them. But when I look back, it's it's these subconscious me messages that he was putting in, which drove us on. Um, we didn't come out to second place. We didn't drop below second place all season. It was it was unbelievable. From about the fifth game in, we knew we were going to get promoted. How hard is the championship this year? That's the hardest league in the world. How, do you, yeah. Did you feel that? Um, or were you so above your own ability that you thought this is easy yes. I, I deserve to be Premiership yeah yes. did you feel that yes because you, would you bang in 20 goals that season 27. as well yeah 27 so I knew I was negotiating with Nicola again one of the hardest negotiators that you'll ever have to meet trying to get a new contract out of him so he was like no no you'll have this so I was like I'll pr if I have to prove to you I'm the best player in this league even though I haven't played a game in it I'll prove to you as well so I knew I was the best player in that, in that championship before it even kicked the ball because the preparation I'd done under Nigel Atkins for that preseason, I, I have never felt as good as that. Never, never. I, I, yoga came into my life. Meditation came into my life. Um, Who ingrained that into you? It was Nigel Atkins, um, Matt Ratcliffe, the, the physio. Um, Sarah Ramsden, which is a, a girl, who, a woman who specializes in yoga, she was coming into the club but I was going to see her privately um, 
It was it was the the, the team that Southampton had was a team that you could only wish for. But honest to God, I put everything all ever all my success down to the people who were at Southampton and the fans. It was a perfect mix for me. Absolutely perfect mix. They pointed me the, in the right direction at the right time to meet the right people. And I, t- I was in this state of mind to, uh, to listen to them, acknowledge what they're actually saying. And it was, it was a perfect combination. So when the, the, the physical shape I felt that, that season was in, incredible. So I knew I was going to smash that league. Absolutely smash it. I think I'd done 27 goals and 14 assists, which was the leading goal count until Mitovic beat it, I think, last season or the Bastard. season before. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we all pretend we weren't makers, bro, but realistically, you think you bastard, mate, get injured. <laughs> because I listen to people, I listen to, even the snooker, I watch any sport, but I watch the snooker, Ronnie O'Sullivan's yeah. playing, and Stephen Henry, you can tell, oh, yeah. they're talking about breaking records, you can tell it. I don't want any record that you've got, for me personally, I wouldn't want anybody yeah. to break it, no, I don't give a fuck. A it's not a case of, oh yeah, good luck yeah. to him, I hope he does that. Fuck him, mate. I hope he gets injured. That'd be seen. <laughs> yeah. No, I think um, I think you're spot on, mate. I think I think everyone's like that. But they're too nice to just say that what you've just said. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what they're thinking. That's exactly what I was thinking. But oh, the the the, the numbers he was getting, I knew he was going to smash it. Not just beat it, but smash it, and he did. So fair play to him, like. But yeah, I was gutted. Yeah. <laughs> so how was your drinking then? Was it, you had so it was that better. balanced everything with the yoga, was, meditation? Under Nigel and under Pardew, under Nigel, the drinking was still there. Even that in-house drinking was still there. But the, and the binge drinking, the binge drinking was, uh, again, still a problem. Binge drinking with me, it's horrible. Uh, that's the one thing, that's the hardest thing I've had to change in myself is the drinking and especially the binge drinking. Because the person I become when I binge drink is not the person I want to associate myself with. And that was the person people was associating with me because that's the, the, the actions I was doing. That's they're the words that I was using. I was always upsetting someone, always saying something that I shouldn't have said, always waking up, not, not having a clue what I'd said, what I'd done. It was embarrassing, embarrassing. It took years and years to get out of that system, to, to get out of that them actions. And that that I do regret that so much is the, the the binge drinking, and that only stopped a few years ago. A few years ago, thankfully, uh, I've got it, I've got got it under control. But the the drinking at that time was was still going on. Yeah. What about when you went to the Premiership? What was that feeling like? Knowing you were going to the Premiership, everything you've ever dreamed of as a kid, everything's kind of came into play. What were you twenty seven, twenty eight then? Yes. What was that feeling for you? Your first game Premiership. Amazing amazing so did you feel as if you'd arrived at yeah. home yes i felt like i felt all i felt 10 foot tall and then the, the manager pulled me to one side saying you're on the bench tomorrow why <laughs> after scoring <laughs> yeah. 50 60 goals in two seasons yeah yeah so we, he, i i can remember just going blurry and just fucking filled with rage i can't remember exactly what he was saying to me to be honest but i think it was along the lines of ghoulies that to Prado is going to play because he can get into the channels and we need to spread them. We're going to have to... And do you know what? When I look back, it was probably spot on what he was saying, but at the time, I just took it personal. Mm-hmm. And I just said, what I'd said to Nicola and what I'd said to other managers, if I need to prove to you that I'm good enough for this league, I'll prove to you. Prove to N- Nicola the season before because he was trying to get rid of me in the championship. So now if you're trying to get rid of me in the premiership, I'll prove to you that I'm the best striker for this club in the Premier League. He's like, it's not like that, it's not like that. I was like, it is, it is. It's exactly what it is. Two years I've had under you and what I've done to get this club promoted and then the first sense of Premier League football, you show the world that I'm, I'm on the bench. So that sends a message out straight away that you think I'm not good enough and I've done everything that I've needed to do, you think I've already done it. So I'll, I'll prove you wrong as well. So, I was a caged animal on that on that bench. Absolute cage caged animal. I could not wait to get on the pitch. Um Do you think he could have done that because he knows how your mindset worked yeah. with I'm gonna show you a cunt. He, you think he was showing me? No, yeah, just to sh- maybe he knew exactly who you were as a person because you're always trying to prove to someone 
that was a tactic to keep him on the bench because he knows, like you say, Kate's yeah. an animal. I'm going to prove to you, you can't. Yes. Yeah, no, that. I, also, the tactical side, also, but also, yeah, maybe. Yeah, um, if we, because he did say the words, I want to bring you on with the score still close. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was, it was, they were winning one nil, so it was close. Um, so when I look back, it did make sense. But like I said, I took it too personal. I, I took it very personal. Um, and when I came on, like I said, it took me two minutes to score. I was I just burst. Just the feeling when it dropped. And then I knew it was in before it kicked it. I knew it was in. So all my life was leading up. And I was like, right, Premier League, Premier League. I'm going to have to... I'm gonna have to do it again, and then the ball drops you, and then you see it the net, and then I turn, and all my fans are there, the Southampton fans are there. It was incredible. I never thought that moment would ever get beaten. I thought that moment was the pinnacle of my career, the, pinnacle, the best moment of my football career, and it would never ever be beaten. It was an incredible moment. So, ten, do you feel as if you were, if you'd done everything that you'd done at 25, 26, 27, you'd have been in the Premierships ten years earlier? How does that mindset? Looking back at that, do you feel as if you done yourself a disjustice or did you feel as if it was just the way your cards were played out? No, I did do myself an injustice, 100%. Um, but when I say that, my mind was my mind. My mentality was my mentality. So it's hard to say. It's hard, it's hard, it's hard to understand. Because I can remember myself at 20. I can remember myself at 22. It's hard to think that person was able to change at that age because he wasn't. And so I wasn't ready for it. So my career was probably exactly the way it should have been. And I said to you before, the impact I had on the Premier League was probably bigger than if I had looked after myself better, got to the Premier League earlier than, than what I did because I would have, I probably would have played more games, made a lot more money, but the impact would have, would, I don't think it would have been as big. Well, because I'd been held, held back by myself for so long, so long, I was like a spring. So when you did finally let go, it reached heights that probably I wouldn't have got to if I got to the Premier League earlier. Were you had four years in the Premier League with Southampton? Yeah. No, two years with Southampton, one year with Liverpool, one year with West, West Brom. What was it like at Southampton for the two years? Amazing. Amazing. Best time of my, my career. Yeah. Uh, especially under Mauricio. Pochettino. How good is Pochettino? Amazing. Is he? Yes. Tactical genius? Tactical genius, but unbelievable man management as well. Because where did you just finish in the league? You just finished high up. Eighth. Eh? We finished eighth. It was our highest ever at that time. It was our highest ever finish in the Premier League. So it was an unbelievable achievement. And he brought in football that I think has been replicated since. After like He said that he changed the Premier League and I, I think he got laughed at but I think if you look back at the time at that Southampton team what he did and the way they played and the way they pressed a lot of teams have replicated it since and a lot of ch chairmen have looked for managers who play exactly that style how good was Alana? <laughs> he was unbelievable did he you know he was a player in League One? yes yeah because League One you know yourself people can't they can't usually kick on but that team kicked on where yeah. you had four or five players who then fucking spread their wings and went yeah. mega. Yeah. Did you know that he was, yes. that he's got something? Do From you know a player, anybody who's ever played that kind of understands football, you just know someone's got something. Yeah. But whether the kick on's a different ball game, did you know that he was special as well? From the first training session, I knew he was special. Uh, his touch is the best I'd ever seen. His vision, his passing, everything. And in the games, um, they don't want to keep on hold him because when they went into administration I think it was QPR who wanted him and was trying to get him and he was a little bit down he'd been relegated um, he was he was a little bit under pressure but I think he came round and he could see the vision at Southampton so when we knew that we kept him my first thought was how can I get the ball to Adam that was it mm -hmm. he was that good so he was the he was that good in League One, but he was slight. He was nimble. When he when he became when he got to the Premier League, he was a man. He was a captain. He was he was 
like under Positino physically, like Positino got everyone a, like an animal. He was unbelievable. He was unstoppable. So when he got to the Premier League, and when you get to the Premier League, it's 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 weird because you don't you get more time in the Premier League if you can control the ball. It, as soon as you miscontrol it, bang, it's gone, and they'll go and score. But if you can control it, they give you the respect. So I think it became easier for Adam the higher he went up because his con his control was impeccable, or even under pressure. So we had more time to to do what he could do with the ball, and he was just I think he got a team of the year the first season in the Premier League, which is incredible. What was it like scoring your hundredth goal for Southampton? Yeah, it was it was good, but it was in a loss. It was in a loss. So it was it was against Newcastle four two away, but. I, what what was a better moment than that is that the lads got me a top I've got in the house there, tongue up in the wall, uh, with a hundred on, and they've all signed and put messages, and they gave it to me in the dressing room. I think it was on the Monday after, and that touch like that meant more to me than scoring the goal, because um, I could see, I could then see, oh God, it is it is a good good achievement what I've done for this club. It's like I've. Not only scored a hundred goals, of like the, them goals have helped this club get to these players where where they are today. So when did Liverpool come knocking? Was did you ever think that would happen? Later, no. wait, were you thirty one? Thirty two. It's fucking mad. <laughs> that is mad when you think about it. From the lower leagues to Rochdale to absolutely thinking I can't do this anymore. Yeah. To putting on weight to then becoming leading goal scorer, both divisions going to the Premier Division. And then one of the biggest teams on the planet, Liverpool. Yeah, so under, I uh, just go back under Mar Mauricio. My drinking was the best it's uh, ever been. Who, who was that down to you? Or was no, it? that was down to his regime. Now, it, physically, I couldn't do it. I literally could not have a drink and then get into that team. He, he was in every day, um, and the training was ridiculous. Do some managers demand more of you? Yes. Do they know? Because anybody, you can tell the hangover or someone slipping, you think, yeah. he's off it today. Yeah. Could you not afford no. to have any no, slip-ups, no, not day. even an inch to no. give away? No, no, no. I, it, it was ridiculous. Is that a good manager for you? Yeah. Who sees the thing, same as Alec Ferguson, the shit that went on at Man United. Yes. But he kept it on a leash. Yeah. Do you believe that's a good manager who understands the players more? People... Kind of understanding the person instead yeah. of... There's a lot of managers who pretend to care about your social side or your personal life. And you can see right through them. But these same managers who not only care about your personal life, go out to make sure that your personal life is good, healthy, first. And knowing that if that's good and healthy, then it's going to help him and help the team. And that's what Mauricio does, did. He would make sure that your personal life is okay and he would constantly ask questions and stuff like that. So, but his training, it was the, it was his training what stopped me from drinking. He called it the super Superman syndrome. So the Superman syndrome is that his belief is that Superman has no powers. He's just from a extreme environment that when he took out of that environment and put onto our environment, he's, he's Superman, he's got Superman powers. So the analogy is that if you train six days a week, way, way harder than, to, to, to an extreme, that on the Saturday, the game will feel easier. That was his mentality. So training was ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. Um, so that that's why I gave up drinking. So, and again, my my career was up here at this point and I, was, I felt like I was on a crest of a wave. I've said this many times, everything was going right for me. Everything I was touching was turning into gold. I was scoring in the Premier League, got picked for England, scored for England with my first touch. Against Scotland, that's one way to, <laughs> that's one way to fuck up our, our friendship straight away, you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> first touch against Scotland. I always knew there was something iffy about you, mate. <laughs> yeah. How was that feeling? That was, that was the best moment of my career. Was it? Yeah. Sorry. That's okay, mate. We'll edit that out, mate. <laughs> <laughs> you always wear a shite player, mate. <laughs> so what was that feeling then? Yeah. Was it come on as sub three two, wasn't it? Yeah. Massive two, game, two. mate. Oh mate, I couldn't have scripted it any better. Two two. Wembley was bouncing. 
Scottish brought thousands, I think about 10,000. It was unbelievable atmosphere. Come on, 20 minutes to go. Bang, first touch, goal. Unbelievable, unbelievable. What's the feeling like when you when you score in front of 80,000 and for your, <sighs> your whole country and God. just, is it a sense of pride or you, is it emotional or how do you feel? It's the most emotional I've ever been. Um, Scored playing football. It was it was uncontrollable, uncontrolled. My face was twitching, my my body was twitching. I could not hold the emotion in. It was bursting out of me. It was too much. It was it literally too much. I ran over to like my family brought about eighty seven people, eighty seven people, cousins, friends, family. Two, I think, two coach loads. It was incredible and. I ran to them, I was trying to get to them, it was incredible. And when I was doing the interview afterwards, they were all there, right there, all all still cheering. And I was just like blown away doing the interview. It was like trying to get me, me words out to explain how I feel, and I couldn't. I literally couldn't get the words out to explain how I feel. And even to this day, it's hard to explain how that felt. Um, And it was so surreal that you question yourself, did that actually happen? Did that did that actually happen? Because my career, I was in League Two, League One for so long, and now I'm in the Premier League, and I've just scored for England. What on earth is going on? What on earth is going on? And that's why, what I say, I was on a crest of a wave, and then I get picked for the England team, uh, the England World Cup, and then Liverpool coming for me. Liverpool coming for me. So you can imagine my my period of my life at that time. That's unbelievable. Like I said before, it was not as like a fairy tale. Yeah. It's unbelievable. For there's not many people playing League Two. Listen, unless you're in a Premier team and getting loaned out, but to come from that and screw in the head, and that's so important for anybody listening. Screw the head, work in your fitness, work in your inner belief, and anything is possible. Yes. It's never too late. Twenty seven to be making changes and still kicking on and that. having an unbelievable career shows you people think their careers are over at seventeen. <laughs> I was saying this to you today. People at twenty two think it's too late to do anything. Yeah. And I was like, if you, oh my word. So yeah, what you've just said is absolutely spot on. I was kidding myself. I knew I wasn't giving myself. Stop looking at other people. Look at yourself. Do everything that you know that you can do. And I promise you it will be enough. And if it's not, you'll be able to live with yourself. What I would what I'm so happy that didn't happen to me, which I was so close to many times, is that I kidded myself. I pretended that I was given everything when I knew I wasn't, and then I almost lost it all. I all them moments I've just talked told about, they almost didn't didn't come because I didn't give it everything. And thankfully I got that moment where I switched over and I gave it everything physically. See, when being on such a high, scoring for England, you say it's the best moment of your life in football. How do you come down from it with with kind of ease and slowly? Or is that why a lot of drink kicks in with people because they don't know how to come down from that adrenaline rush? Uh, Yes, I can definitely, especially people who wasn't drinking throughout the career and they were getting them highs and then their career stops and then they're like, wait, wait, and and then, then they do start drinking or taking drugs or gambling and they get them highs i can i can definitely understand why them people go under them players go under and they they go too far that side um 100 percent, yeah so you're saying from liverpool did was that always on the cards did they know you were a massive fan yes did was that always something you tried to push for or was it just a dream that you never thought would be possible or did you always have that and i believe i'm going to walk out in the red shirt one day <sighs> I, I again I used to, I used to manifest it law of attraction did you understand it then no what you were manifesting no. no but I used to think of me playing for Liverpool and scenarios of me playing for Liverpool scoring for Liverpool winning the league with Liverpool winning the FA Cup with Liverpool I used to do this with, with England I used to do this with playing football when I started to understand about manifestation all all everything Everything I manifested came through. Everything. Mm-hmm. Everything. Um, so when Liverpool came, it was, I think the first words I said to my agent was, fuck off. Like, it was like, no, this can't be true. Like, this is incredible what's happening to, to me right now. Um, I was going through a journey which was which was incredible. It's unbelievable about that. Unbelievable. And the thing about manifestation, what I've realised 
I understood that. I read it and the book is secret in my twenties. But I used to always kind of feel as if I was chasing it because I was in a life of kind of pain and misery. So when you manifest it, it becomes fuzzy and the energy frequencies or whatever it is. Yeah. When you become a clean, more clean living, everything you yes. manifest comes into fruition. Yes. Maybe it's three years or five years, but you keep believing it, keep working towards it. Yeah. It does happen. And that's how powerful the mind is. We don't even really truly understand the mind and how it works, how it functions. I just know, even us sitting here, it's all from manifestation. It's all from thoughts to then reaching out and to then making it happen and putting it into existence. So when Liverpool came calling, what you're thinking, because you're end of, not the end of your career, but you know yourself, you've only got a few years left, but it's just a case of, this is, this no, is it. So, yeah, so I was thinking, I'm going to go and help because Liverpool came so close. And I was hoping to be go there with Luis Suarez, but Louis went. So, but I was still so mentally strong at this point, so mentally strong that I was going there to help Liverpool win that league. I was going to be the difference to push them over the line this season with the help of others. I think San, I, I was getting told Sanchez is coming in to replace Louis. I'm coming in to to help, and together we were going to push Liverpool to the to to the tail. That's the way I was thinking. And then reality happened. Liverpool happens. I I get my chances. And where I normally bang goal, it was going wide. I was hitting the post. And then I get another chance. Bang, header, goal. No, keeper saved it. And it's just little things like that, which normally was just going in for me, right, left and centre throughout, throughout them years. At Liverpool, it was just a little bit of a change. And the noise is very loud at Liverpool. Very, very loud. It's not like Southampton or any other club. Like, obviously, these Man, Man United and other teams like that, the size of it. But for me, the noise was very, very loud. Very different. So even when I played well and scored, or it was... Oh, Ricky Lambert's, it was like Ricky Lambert's shit, get him out of the team. It was like, whoa, wow, this is this is new. So I, I got a run of six games. I scored two, assisted one, but the last three games, my performance wasn't good enough. So I got brought out to the team. That was it. That was it. That I knew that was my chance gone because we're at a club like Liverpool. You don't get second chances. You don't get second, third chances. I was getting little minutes here and there. And if I could turn them, like, appearances round and score and do, then it, I, I could get another start. But I was getting then starts here and there. And it was that. It was, it was that moment that he put me in the team. And I didn't do good enough. That was it. That was my time at Liverpool done. And he tried to shipped me out to Crystal Palace in January. And I was like, are you are you crazy? Like, why on earth would I go to Crystal Palace? I've just left Southampton for five years. They all love me to come to Liverpool. The only club I would come to. So why would I leave now after three, four months? Not a chance. He's like, no, no, that's fine, that's fine. But I'm just saying, if you stay, there's not going to be much time for you. I was like, I don't care, I'm not, I'm not going. And that, from that point on, I didn't touch the ball on a pitch for three months. Three months, I did not get on a pitch, didn't touch a ball. And that was probably the most difficult period of my career. Did you feel it as if your boyhood heroes, and did you feel, not let down, but did you feel as if you had your chance and you blew it? Or did you feel as if you deserved another chance? No, no, I felt like I'd blew it. I felt like I'd um, had my chance and yeah, I, I'd ruined it. But not only that, it was like looking back, thinking what I'd left behind. How good was Gerard? He was at the end of his yeah, career. That was no, his last mate, season. Mate. It was it was in his last year, but unbelievable player. What was his training like? Was it, I hear people training? He just used to <laughs> drill the ball to people, and yeah. they had to work on their touch. Was yeah. that the case? It was intimidating. No mistakes and intimidating. Like the the amount of perfection that you had to put in, especially if you're on his team, was scary. But I loved it. I loved it. Like the sessions were incredible because of Stevie. Like everyone was at the top of the game because of Stevie. If someone wasn't on it, it wasn't the uh, the manager pointing them out. It was Stevie. And I, I think it was like the fifth or sixth session that I was training. Lucas, I think Lucas had fell out. Um, Lucas Lever had fell out. 
of love with the the board with his contract or something I'm, I'm not sure so he was sulking and in training you could see it and steve just went stop 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 it and i'm like what the fuck? i've never seen this before i couldn't play a stop on a training session and then he just goes absolutely berserk what the fuck are you doing pointing at lucas went on for him about 30 seconds sort your fucking self out now and Lucas was like what? what what am i doing what am i doing and, and he honestly he just tore him and 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 i was like wow wow that just set the tone for the rest like the the the, the few weeks it was incredible and lucas would like that was it then lucas was just on it there's liverpool the most demanding team for yeah. success yeah. they've won trophies for so as long as that has obviously the premier league was a big one yeah. how was gerard was it a season before he don't even want to mention still have football fans but is that a season he slipped yeah and then the season on to try and the, the pressure that must have been on him he must have felt as if that was his chance <laughs> yes yeah i think he's talked about it quite he's open to talk about it as well isn't he i think that's his obviously biggest regret that, um it's 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 hard for me to talk about because i was i was a liverpool fan I was like, I was absolutely devastated that it happened and it devastated more so for, for Gerard because I wanted him to win it. As much as I wanted Liverpool to win, I wanted Gerard to win it. So I could see how much that was hitting him. And it was it was clear to see, like it was affecting him. Mm -hmm. There's no way of getting around it. So after Liverpool, you get loaned out. Is it West Brom? West Brom, no, I left. So I had another year at Liverpool, but I knew I wasn't. I wasn't going to play. It's horrible being at a club when you know you're not wanted. It's horrible. And the last thing I was going to do is stay at Liverpool when I'm not wanted. So I, w I went to West Brom with Steve uh, Pulis, Tony, Tony Pulis. Um, again, had me off the opportunities. Didn't quite take it. I, I think the gold just had wore, wore out. I was 33, 34 at this point. I couldn't quite do it. And... If you're in the Premier League after 30, it's it's tough. It's tough. So being 34, just trying to play in the Premier League, I couldn't do it. Couldn't do it no more. And I was getting appearances, so, but I think my time I was coming to an end. How big is that? Obviously, with the drinking through the years as well, from a young age, do you feel as if that Massively. stopped an extra couple, two, three years for kicking on and still being at the top of your game? 100%. And I would say this to the kids today is that when you get over 30 you need to Suzu said this to me um, Mauricio's assistant he said for every year that you get over 30 you need to lose five five pounds is it five pounds um like half a stone or a couple, couple of pounds I can't remember no not half a stone bloody hell no that'd be impossible a couple of pounds you need to get lighter and you need to like you need to be fitter because inside you is genetically getting worse like mm -hmm. so you need to give it more so if you carry on your same life after 30 then you, you, you're doomed you're doomed you have to you have to change you have to increase it and that's what i would say is that look after yourself even more when you turn 30 because in football now there's not many footballers playing regularly after 30 yeah you look at big Ibrahimovic who's just retired but you look at listen Rooney unbelievable player world class player but you look at the same ages of Rooney and Ronaldo yeah. they kind of slit him listen Rooney's put on the beef Ronaldo's still playing it's just mad to see the jockey of the tennis yeah. just seems to be getting fucking better I can't <laughs> I it's unbelievable but Imagine. you just see who's the most dedicated player you've seen where they just didn't want to give up football so they just lived and breathed it where they, they did that half a stone every year when they get older they got fitter did you see any players like yeah, that yeah I come across Henderson Jordan Henderson um, he didn't drink J did he James Milner Milner did it it was yeah, Milner yeah. I think unbelievable prof professionals unbelievable um, that's the way that's the way to do it that's the only way to do it there's no secret there's no secret to it that is the only way if you want to play and until 35 36 37 you've got to look at james jordan jordan henson james milner what they do every day of their life and you've got to copy it did you see that in some players where do these people distance themselves from the other players who like to socialize and like to be with each other like you say is a brotherhood did you see a lot of the, the ones who didn't drink <laughs> james, more lonely? No, james milner would, would go out yeah but he just wouldn't drink 
that's that's all meant like he was mentally strong enough to do that just when nothing would would phase him he would have a laugh he would have a joke he was socially there he was present um yeah it was he was yeah it was unbel unbelievable i i couldn't do that i couldn't do that i couldn't go to a bar or a nightclub and not drink and all my mates drink around me i couldn't do it i'd either get off or start drinking that's one that, that, that's how mentally weak i was so to, to to get to the levels that they got to, that's how that's how mentally strong you have to be. How hard was it when their career was coming to an end? It was tough, but it's it's funny, it's mad when when you. It's, I'm going to say this now. I, I don't want to come across like I was driven by money because I know anyone who knows me knows I wasn't. But I made more money in my last three years of my career combined than all my other years of playing football. So it became a another goal for me of trying, like, right, I need to try and make as much money now as I can before my career's over. And, yeah, that was my objective then, is to try and get contracts um, and try and earn as much money. Does it become desperate at the end that we are just hanging on or, or is it a case of I've still got it, I can still play? Uh <laughs> But above, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it's poker. It's poker face. Uh, I, I tell you. So I, I signed two years with Cardiff, and honestly, I gave it everything. Cause Cardiff, I, I moved down there with my family, put the kids, kids there. I gave it everything. I was trying to be as fit as I, I could be under Paul Trollop. Um, Paul Trollop got sacked. Neil Warner comes in, and I'm trying my best. I'm I'm scoring a couple of goals, but I can't do the physical physical stuff that he wants. I was 35. 34, 35. And he comes to me and he goes, you can't do what I want you to do. You're not going to be playing for me. I suggest you go elsewhere. And I was like, I've got I've got a year and a half left. I'm, I'm going nowhere. What do you mean? You know, well, what about on loan? I went, I'm not going out on loan. I went, right, okay. Well, you won't be playing for me. I was like, okay. Now, I've never been that type of player. Never. But I'm 35, 34. I have just moved my family up to Cardiff. All in schools, I'm thinking let's see what happens here let's see what happens because i'm not moving i'm not going anywhere so anyway the season finishes i'm at the off season begins i'm trying to negotiate the last year to just give me 20 percent or i don't like no not a chance i'll see you next year i do not want to go back at all my i've moved my family back to liverpool and i do not want to go back but I've still got a year's contract there, so I have to go back. But ideally, I want them to pay me up. So it was like back and forth, back and forth. And it was, they were coming nowhere near. I was getting closer and closer to the time. And I knew not, uh, he didn't want me there. Neil would not want my face around that place because that's the way type of manager he, he, he was. He doesn't want faces around the place that are not there to help him. And he knew, I, 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 he knew that was over between me and him. So I knew that. So I was holding out, thinking, he he'll fold. He'll fold. He'll give me what I want. And it, on the day, on the day, I'm driving up. And I'm talking to my agent, and he's going, you're going to have to go. So going in. And he thinks I'm still going to fold. So I drive into the car park. He sees me. I'm walking in. I get a phone call from my agent. And he goes, you've got what you wanted. <laughs> I've got, Really? And I've gone, make sure. So I go back to the car, say, make sure. And he goes, yeah, you've got it. So I turn around, drive out. And um, I go home. That was it. And if I had to go in and train, I was fucked. Hmm. I was fucked. My body was done. <laughs> My body was done. But I had, to, I had to go to the very end and play poker face with Neil Warnock to get it. What was that like? Yeah not have a plane again oh no by this time i'd um failed at liverpool failed at west brom failed at cardiff by this time i couldn't wait to finish could not wait i was still i was going through trauma from liverpool didn't notice at the time i think i was going through a little bit of depression from liverpool um i and i, I think that carried on for a couple of years from my retirement then as well um so i couldn't wait to get away from football to be honest i hated football and when i retired i didn't watch liverpool didn't watch southampton didn't watch any football just kind of came completely away 
How hard was it in your family, your kids, when because people say that they're obviously lifestyle, but there's a lot more in depth of what people actually have to go through with the moving schools and kids and new friends. That's a lot in itself. How hard is it for families to kind of go through the motions of if you're not playing well and bringing that energy back home and the moving yeah. all the time? Do you know if if say I have a bad game at Southampton and uh, Southampton are hammering me and in the paper they're hammering me. My family are not from Southampton, so they don't care. When I moved to Liverpool, my mum and dad, all my family are Scousers. My wife is Scouse. My kids are in Scouse schools, Scouse friends. And the Liverpool fans are hammering you. The Everton fans are hammering you. In the papers are hammering you. It's a tough place to be. It's a tough place to be. It's, the, it's what we signed up for. It's what we agreed on. That's why we get money. I, I understand, but that that was tough. That was tough to handle. Yeah, you went to Liverpool at the end of the stage of your career. Is that another thing in your mind where if you screwed in at a younger years, Liverpool, Liverpool would have got the best yes. years of you? Yes. Yeah. And you feel... Yeah. If you, uh, imagine, imagine me, I had my time at Southampton and then my peak years at Liverpool. It would have been different, but I wouldn't have had me years at Southampton, and which I wouldn't change that for the, for the world. Yeah, it's not an unbelievable career. Yeah. People would do... Uh, bite your arm and leg off for half a career yeah. do you know what I mean to 100 goals and scoring 37 in a season signing for Liverpool playing for England scoring against Scotland but <laughs> that's an unbelievable that's an achievement in itself from people who get that career usually have started off maybe in the, the championship went to the premiership you started off league two you started off at the fucking dregs yeah. the bottom and it's no disrespect to anybody who's playing in those leagues because it's still got to do what they've got to do but you've kicked on and progressed and won the league league one championship premiership scoring goals I said that's what dreams are made of in my eyes so I, see, I see that now but at first I didn't uh -huh. I just seen myself as a failure and that I, that went on for a few years and it wasn't until I started coming out of the depression that I started looking back on my pr career with pride and now I look back on it and think, oh my word, what a career I had. Exactly what you've just said. I see everything that I've done and I look at it in positive. Even the, even my Liverpool time now, I look at it in a positive light. I think any sports star or anybody always feels as if they can give more. They always think it never end. Yeah. And that's the thing, life does come to an end. People we love eventually disappear and go and it's just life, it's stages, <laughs> yeah. it's chapters, it's just yep. the fucking journey. How did you get out of the depression? Did anybody say, look, man, you've had a fucking great career, you don't need to dwell on it? Or were you just, why were you beating yourself up so much? Um, I didn't know it was. I didn't know it was. Did I, your missus not say to you? No, I no. I don't think she could see. I think um, I'd been in it for so long. It, it wasn't just like one moment I was this person, next moment I was this. It was a gradual escalation from Liverpool to West Brom to Cardiff. That when I, she, there was a big change in me in Cardiff. I knew my career was coming to an end, and that's when I started um, probably searching a little bit outside the football. That's when I became aware, awakened. That was my first awakening of how the world actually works. And that, that's when my missus seen a change in me. That's when I kind of went under a little bit because it, it hit me like a ton of bricks realising how the world works. And um, not realising how the world works. Is that people know how it works and they accept it. It's crazy. It was crazy for realising it. So this is what we'll touch on now. You say it was a spiritual awakening. You say it was That time it wasn't. That, that was a just an awakening of how the world works. Mm -hmm. The one I had lately was a spiritual awakening. How hard does that footballer involved in the masses that's involved in the game as well is no matter if people understand that but this is the kind of stuff that i like to touch on because yeah. the masses listen i keep saying it but you feed them bread and water they're kind of distracted to what's really going on in the world and who's controlling it and who's funding it and how corrupt it can be there's a lot of beautiful things in the world a million percent i've seen it yeah but there's also a lot of fucking fuckery goes on and this is the stuff that we're trying to teach and educate and make sure it's the right things to say and promote because a lot of people now are in a, in a position where they're struggling mentally, physically, financially, yeah. most of all spiritually. But what's it like for you being a footballer? People looked up to you, amazing career, to then speaking out about mad shit where people then think they're making jokes. You look at guys like David Dyke, Matt Letizia, who, who I love to bits. Two guys, listen, they've done their thing, but they're speaking out against things that people don't understand. 
how hard is that for you to then be doing that yeah it's tough it's um i didn't do for years like i said it was 2016 2017 that i realized what what was going on um and i was just telling my friends and family who again thought i would i was going a little bit crazy um it wasn't it wasn't until obviously covid hit and it wasn't until the realization of scientists and doctors and uh, very clever clever a lot clever than me coming to the same conclusion that i'd come to a few years earlier of what is actually happening which then really really started to bother me which then made me feel like i need to start speaking out and start speaking out a little bit louder even though it wasn't along the lines of Matt Letizia, I was starting to speak out a little bit and starting trying to point people in the right direction, especially against the vaccines. Um, and I was getting a lot of comeback, a lot of comeback, even though I was nowhere near as loud as Matt. Um, yeah, that was that was the initial journey that, 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 that I was on. But like you said, it's... You can. I think there are a lot of people are awake to the most obvious things about money and uh, major companies and bankers and stuff like that and how the world works and that. The, the, but when it goes a little bit further than that, and what what the elites are actually like and how horrific these people are and how horrible they are, that's when people come back and that's when people can't handle it. Yeah, because it's scary because yeah. you can be shut down in a heartbeat. You can be discredited where you're signed off as a fruitcake. Yeah. And that's the scary thing because we don't have all the answers in life, but what we can do is question them. Yeah. Why? Why are they making us do this? Why is the schooling system like that where people are just dumbed down to then understand mathematical shit and wars and all the stuff that's in the past, stuff that's irrelevant for later in life. Listen, I, I believe everybody should be learning how to read and write and understanding, but where's the communication skills? Where's the, the fitness and the mindset and understanding love and money management and even death? We don't yeah. get taught how to handle death. Somebody can lose a loved one at a young age and it affects them for the rest of their life. Yeah. Well, me understand life does go on, but it's to try and question everything. And Matt Letizia is standing at the forefront and it takes a lot of guts because people ridicule, people try and embarrass, yeah. people try and shoot you down when you think, am I going crazy? Yeah. Listen, we're all fucking going crazy, but it's to understand the game that we're in and understanding what is this? Just question it. Why are we here? What's created us? And what about certain foods and water? And, and it's so, listen, conspiracy, not whatever it is, but you've got to question everything. Where yeah. does it come from? What's their motive? Do the government really care? And you'll actually break it down in the history of hundreds and hundreds of years. It's the same patterns. If it's not fucking vaccines, it's you've got the plague and you've got wars and it's it's coming round in full circle every time. So the clues are there, but because people are so caught up in it, and people are scared. And when the COVID shit came, listen, people were genuinely scared. People thought they were going to die. Yeah. But that yeah, when you've got sitting in pubs and you're sitting two meters apart, as if some sort of infection ain't going to reach two meters, but yet. It's just yeah, no, crazy. It's, it's laughable. <laughs> it's, I seen yeah. Holly Willy Billy, Holly Willy Billy, Billy, or whatever the fuck her name is, and Philip Schofield were cuddling <laughs> through a screen with like plastic yeah. gloves, and and people who watch it, it can affect you because you're oh shit, the world's going to end. Yeah. But yet we're all standing outside with pots and pans at eight o'clock at night, celebrating what? Celebrating being locked up, yeah. businesses being shut down, suicide on the rise, addiction on the rise. But there's no pand pandemic for that because more people died through that than anything else. But they don't show those numbers on Sky News. They'll not yeah. show those numbers in the newspapers. They'll scare monger you into believing. I need to get a vaccine. Listen, if you got it, it's down to you. Yeah. But I think a lot more people are awakened up with all the facts and figures coming out now where people are going have I just been fooled and I genuinely believe there is a shift of people understanding wait a minute something ain't right the power of the people has always been stronger than the masses but people are so caught up in a world where they need to work to survive they're too scared listen I can't speak out if I lose my job my kids go hungry no, and that's that, yeah. scary yeah. yeah no I totally understand that and they're too busy to as well they're too busy to um, actually re do the research or listen to someone or listen they're too, they're too busy so they look at the so-called pharmaceutical scientists or what they've said and they go well that must be the truth and i would have i would have if i wouldn't have went through that awakening at 2016-17 i pro probably would have but i knew they were telling lies from the from the get-go and 
I totally understand with what you're saying. With uh, it's all it's it's happened all over before, but what they have got planned, this is it. That's the end game. What they've got for us, where digital enslavement, the social credit system, that is the end game. So our children won't have a chance to do what we're trying to do is trying to wake everyone up to actually what is that what they're about to put on onto us. So we have to do it. This is the generation, me, you, our children won't have a chance because if they're put into the system, they, the elites, these horrible people who we've just been talking about, they have got more power than they have ever had just to just switch someone like me off and just not just switch me off to get rid of everything. Yeah, of course. Of One world currency, and then they're talking about microchipping. You're talking about so much shit and destruction of where you're fully controlled. Yeah. Where you're talking, listen, you look at the clones now, you look at robots, you look at how the, the technology has advanced. You start off with the mobile phones, people so connected to it where they're brainwashed into believing the mobile phone. So now people in Sweden, I had David Dyke on, he says that people in Sweden were actually queuing up to be microchipped. People now can pay with their bills through microchip and have money yeah. and everything's just in this machine where there's no currency, there's no money, it's a one world order. It's fucking nuts. And it's close to being at maybe <laughs> 30, 40, 50 years, maybe closer to actually everything being fully controlled. F 30 years? You think now? Now? You think so? Yeah, I think two. You think so? Two years. Yeah, it was supposed to be 2030, but I think they brought mm -hmm. it forward. I think 2025, it'll all be done. But the fuckery, One way or the other. Yeah, the fuckery in this world is you're talking about bringing the age of consent down. You're talking about people, men now going into women's toilets and changing rooms because they're identifying as certain people. And I always have to state this. I do not give a fuck if you're trans, bi, straight, yeah. what colour you are, what religion you are. If you're a wanker, you're a wanker. If you're going to put a dress on and then pretend to be a woman to then take, do the toilet in front of kids, for me, you're a fucking sex case. No. And yeah. I don't care. And it's not, listen, there's people who are trans and buying straight who just got on with their life. Well, this is what I'm saying. This, hide behind this the what radar. I'm worried about is that the government are turning us against, against trans people and bisexual people. And they, they, they're trying to turn us against each other again. And we're falling for it again. We're doing it again. They're putting up stories. And that they are bad, st the horrific stories, but we've got to, we've got to be careful. We cannot be turned against anyone no more. We have got to all come together and fight against these globalists and the governments that have been took over. We have got to all come together. We cannot be fighting against each other no more. This is what they're purposely doing, and we keep on falling for it every single time. They're putting rules in in school so we, purposely we get angry over it. So we go crazy at a certain person. We're doing it again. We're falling for it. It's we, divide and conquer. They've yeah. done that for many years. It's manipulation tactics. But we can stop it. We can stop it. We can stop it. We can, we've still got time to stop it because they've they've been rushed into COVID. Now it's the climate scam. They've been they've now shown their faces. The monsters are there for all of us to see. We know who they are. They've had, they've had to come out so we can all see them. We all know exactly who these people are. So now we've got a choice and it's it's a choice to take back our freedom and stop these from putting us into a digital enslavement and a social credit system. We've got a choice and we've got to all come together right now. To how, do you, how do you think we get back with freedom then? What do you think is the main source to then go, wait a minute, we need to make a stand? Because you know yourself, you make a stand. If you grow enough following and enough noise, bang, discredited. What are you doing? You're this, they, you're that. They, they put laws and rules onto us and they, they only work because we consent to them. So when they when they start bringing in these laws, if we get enough people, and I mean millions, in this country, millions, who say they we do not consent to these absurd rules that you are bringing in, we are not going to comply. These 15-minute cities, we are not going to comply. We are going to get rid of them. Then they will not do them. They will back off. And if they do try and do it, the millions will just turn it around. But we've got to have the numbers. But I thought the UK would be the first. The UK seemed to be the weakest. If anyone's crumbling first, it's the UK. No, the, UK. the laws here is fucked. You look at France, <laughs> you look at Italy. People kind of make a stand. Hundreds of thousands hit the streets. They might be causing riots, but they're saying, listen, we ain't taking this shit. Yeah. The UK, it's not happened yet. I'm surprised. I am surprised. Um, but there's so many still asleep. But the, the, the COVID is... 
the, the, the people who are lost, people say to me, why are you trying to still wake people up? The, the, the lost, the, the completely lost. They're not, they're not, they're on the journey. The people who are still lost are the people who are still wearing masks and taking the vaccines and getting the boosters. They're lost. You will never, ever turn them around. But the ones who have stopped taking the vaccine and asking questions, they're on the journey of to, to, to knowing exactly what's going, what they're trying to bring in. It's just a matter of time is can we wake these people up in time before they introduce this social credit system onto us? It's, so it's a race. It's a, it's a race. Can we do it? Can we can we wake enough people? So I'm a, a part of a movement now that is trying to force it through, trying to force the awakening through because I think time is of the essence and I have a massive sense of agency inside me to try and get my voice across now to more people than I have ever had done. And I know that I'm going to get all kinds of things said about me, ridiculed and stuff like that. I do not care no more. I do not care no more. I love my children that much that I will get ridiculed for the rest of my life. I'm far beyond ridiculed. It can go way beyond. I need to to make sure that I have done everything that I I, I can do to to stop this coming from my children. Yeah. children because I'd seen last week you were talking about Doctor Emoto, water ridiculed yeah. social media. People need to understand everything as energy. There's a race chart race jar challenge where you can actually put rice in each jam jar say I love you to one and I hate you to one and after the 30 days the one who say I love you still wait the one who say I hate you is all black blue and moldy yes. the thing is words are powerful you are what you speak if you're yes. going to speak like shit constantly you're going to feel like shit if you speak positive and happy you're going to exactly feel that so everything is energy it's what you put out and I think yes. people because when you talk about being ridiculed this is new for people from you to same as Matt Letizia when they done it David Dyke ridiculed embarrassed try to break them down but then you see the following now that they've got they keep going and people st start thinking wait a minute what if they're right yeah. because how does a how is there a pandemic for a virus that's over 99% survival rate how is that possible but yet they, sh they closed the world down the world went into lockdown yeah. and that's how much they're controlling the world because over 90% of the people believed it yeah. they actually believed that they closed down their businesses the relationships broke down people weren't seeing their loved ones their grands for two and three years and it breaks my heart for yeah. people to actually they killed, that. They killed people, it their wives that. giving birth and they're standing yeah. outside looking through the fucking window yeah. it's unbelievable yeah. even I spoke about it out recently but as soon as you're born everything's wrong everything's backwards the artificial yeah. lighting girls giving birth in their back they're cutting the umbilical cord where you're getting all your nutrients when you're getting all your stem cells you're given a name you're given a religion you're given a football team to support everything's labels you're given yeah. boosters and e-vitamins yeah, and all the, boost, the, boost, the, the bullshit of ADHD's on the rise and everything's on yeah. the rise why because is it, a, is it a connection to vaccines I don't know I'm not a doctor I'm not a scientist but I speak to enough people to understand that all these shit that you're getting is no good for your immune system it's scientifically proven now that all that shit ain't going to help yeah. your immune system if anything it destroys it and it's a scary thing because when you speak out of this shit two or three years ago people call you crazy yeah. I was still climbing mountains and people were shouting oh but what if your grand dies or you're going to kill my grand I'm fucking 50 miles away up a mountain myself <laughs> just showing I had to yeah. keep living because I felt my mental health slipping because I started to buy into it myself should I get the vaccine what if my grand does catch it or my granddad or family and you start thinking am I the wrong guy am I the bad guy thankfully now I stood my fucking ground and it I'm thinking, okay, it's because a lot of people now I put a post out, do you regret it? And over seventy percent regret getting the vaccine. Yeah, I bet it's more. I bet it's more. I f and, and to these people, I, I think a lot of people don't like to admit it. They don't like to admit it that they were good. They got fooled in this way because. But you've got to understand this. This is by far the most advanced uh, trick to man that this world this the human race has ever seen it was always going to it was always going to take take you by surprise and and throw us all under this velvet of total lies and everyone's going to fall for it they was always going to do to all i would say to these people is now now you know they're lying to you now you know that they have killed your loved ones your friends your family now it's time to stand up against these people stop fallen for the for the discrimination of certain types of people in this country and come together we need to start fighting 
one fight against these people who have done that because they are they are the same people and they have shown their faces our governments have been took over by the globalist elites you can see them in each party it's easy to see we need to get these people out as quickly as possible before they give our power over to the wef and the who we've got to do it now got to do it now uh, uh, go back to what you were saying before um about like the jam jar i think these two these two experiments which shows me that um reality is not exactly what we think it is and that you can affect it especially in manifestation so these the the water Dr. experiment Lamoto. yes yep. I, I i recommend everyone to research that it's absolutely incredible and these the double slit experiment have you you've no you've, you've, no so it's the the fire photon through uh, double slits and 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 on the backboard they'll they can see where the photon went when they're not looking the photon turn, turns into a wave so it's it can go everywhere to through two slits it shows it goes through two slits and then it hits a wave on the background but when you examine it with a camera you can see it clearly going through one and it's only one mark it's a little dot on the finger so that clearly tells you that when you experience it and your consciousness is awake to it with us being seeing it it is telling you that it's in one place so what, I, what i'm trying to say is it's everything is a wave everything's a wave but it's how you perceive it in your mind which turns it into reality and that's that that i would recommend people to go and research the double split experiment because it's it just blew my mind and when i when i talk about manifestation and people want proof about manifestation and whether it's true or not go and watch the double split experiment and go and watch the water experiment and that's only two small experiments which i think is starting to prove that manifestation is real and that we can turn this this round if we all come together all with the simple thought of getting rid of these people and having this having an unbelievable future for ourselves we can turn this around what do you think life is what do you think's created i always ask guests this question because i'm still trying to figure it out like are we avatars or we aliens or are we just machines like how's the the human created how is monkeys and giraffes and elephants and seagulls and <laughs> was dinosaurs real how has everything been created is this an illusion that we're in a simulator or we're avatars where i go back and forth when the lights switch off because who knows yeah. the world's round the world's flat the moon landers are real they were fake there's the information there from everything there's there's yeah. there's fights to fight for both sides Who's fucking telling the <laughs> truth? I go back and forth, mate. I'm I'm trying to f figure out that question. Ain't it mad myself. though with eight billion people on the planet? How wonderful the like the world could actually be if everybody could embrace it and enjoy it and plan. But greed poison men's souls and power and it's not listen, greed. It's yeah. not greed. It's not. It's, what do you think it is? It's it's the it's the elites. It's the elites have pushed this onto us. It's it's brainwashing. It's brainwashing. They have pushed this lifestyle onto us, and we have fell for it completely. Mm completely we can turn this round do you feel as if everybody could live a happier life without money without yes. just growing your own fruit yes. growing your own fruit and yes. veg learning from each other different tribes different colors different yes. beliefs learning just because Mag the same yeah. as religion is the biggest fucking yeah. con i believe on the planet yeah it's the I, biggest I, con billions of people christ billions of people muslim but what is are all fighting against each other and <laughs> arguing against each other. Listen, there's yeah. great beliefs and great points in the Bibles and that and the Quran. I get it, I understand that. Yeah. I've got many people who live a, a great life but with certain beliefs. I've worked with homeless people who've turned to Christ and are now helping others try and have a you've got to have a, a belief in a certain higher power that something's there. I get it. But for me it's just so many different religions, so many different gods who's telling the truth. Yeah. It's just is everything planned for humans? Is the world been here for billions of years or we've just been lied to? Is it new? You've got to question it all unless you've seen I see it with my own actual eyes then i've got to think well maybe you are fucking nuts maybe you are telling no, the truth. i think i think some people know exactly what what, what it is and they've they've kept it away from us um but imagine schools got taught it. imagine human beings got started getting told the basics of life itself we can like i said on my my video we can have the life that we've always wanted to be the future it's it i, I can see an unbelievable i have there's definitely 
a shift. split. There's definitely a split. Good and evil, do you think? Yes. And I think it's 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 at, we're at the, the point of choice. How did you think when you seen Matt Letizia coming at the forefront and standing out? World class player, unbelievable. One of the best to ever play in the Premiership, I believe. Like, unbelievable talent, the goals, the penalties. We never even touched on your penalties. I think you were fucking only missed a couple in your career. Like three out of uh, so I took fifty three. I missed three. Uh, that's an unbelievable record. I think Letizia, yourself, Shearer was all up there. Yeah. How do you feel when somebody so high profile, Sky Sports job, making the money, doing his thing, part of the game, same as yourself, football, if we go down that route, it's all part of the game and the yeah. process to keep people occupied. How do you feel when you see some of this? Because you do think, man, that's fucking nuts, but you kind of get a buzz yeah. off. I agree with that. Yes. So it's hard, it's hard for football to, like, like, like you've just said, we are part of the circus. So when you, but it's not as if, we played football to be part of the circus to manipulate people and keep people into the system. That's that's definitely not what I I or Matt or any footballer was 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 trying to do. Obviously, when you come out of football and realise that, yeah, it's it's a kick in the teeth. But you still got a choice. You still got a choice. Are you going to try and help people, Matt? The way Matt came out and spoke. It was it was inspiring. I mean, I was already inspired by him as a man and a footballer. But when he started coming out, but Matt can speak a lot better than most people as well. He's very emotionless when it comes to just facts, and he was perfect for the person to come out and be the light, the shining light for everyone. What dumped my head in is that he was left. He was left, even though a lot of people who he knew stood right was right behind him with his beliefs and his opinions he was left by himself to speak them words there was very few people backing him especially in the football game all pundits all footballers not, not footballers so much because but pundits who were who were backing him in private life just left him and they could see the ridicule he was getting and just thought i don't want any of that even though he's speaking the truth now now that things are turning I'm hoping these people start getting behind them, start getting behind them and start using their voice to get alongside what he's been doing. The interviews that man has done with some of the top scientists, doctors, um, and people involved in that, what was going on at the time is incredible, incredible. And he's a, he's a footballer, an ex-footballer who, who, who done that. So he is my hero and I'm not saying that lightly. He is my hero in life. I look up to Matt more than, probably anyone on, on this planet it's unbelievable people need to understand it takes strength to speak about the masses and speak about what people don't understand it's, it's normal yeah. to sit and work 95 and then go home and watch the TV and watch the news and read the newspapers that's normal yeah. but you're being programmed just like we're being programmed with phones and AI they're promoting whatever they want us to feed into the world is such a mad fucking place but like you says it can be a beautiful place and I feel as if when the change comes, people will go, wait a minute, I want to back these people because losing your family home and losing your business and losing your job it is scary for people. So I understand why people don't speak out. But then change doesn't happen with being a fucking shithouse. Yeah. Change happens when people had enough and go, wait a minute, you ain't feeding my kids that, you ain't buying, you ain't, like we spoke about trans and buys and straight nobody's asked who you are what you are just be you yeah, there's yeah. plenty of people in yeah. the background who just go through their normal life whether they want to wear a dress or fucking be a man be a woman whoever you want to be but just leave the kids alone don't be reading stories and drag queen story times and try to take a piss next to my dogs it ain't gonna end well yeah. and i don't give a fuck if people call me homophobe transphobe whatever the fuck as if me speaking out what i believe in from my own opinion science and me and me being in the wrong and people call me i'm fucking transphobia than i am I don't give a fuck what you're going to do. I've got to have beliefs. I've got kids. I do everything in my power to protect my kids. You can't force shit about me what's wrong to yeah. try and make me believe two and two is six when it's fucking actually four. So I don't give a fuck what anybody but says. It's not trans people bringing this on to us. You, you do know yeah, that. Yeah, of course. This it's is an elite. Agenda. Yeah, of course. It's, an agenda. it's the extremists as well. Like, nobody cares, but it's just the agenda of divide. And then it'll get stronger than yeah. people with the voices. And then it's hatred. And then it's so all the need, negative we, we tension. We need to get the people who are pushing this agenda. But, but how do we though? This is this is what this is what we're trying to do. This is what we're trying to do. We're trying to come together. We've got to get the masses in one simple direction, one simple voice, one simple direction. We do not consent to this bullshit anymore. What do you think about it all? Just what does your family think? 
Play my wife is now weak. She wasn't when I first started speaking to her in 2016. She think you're losing your yeah, shit. She shit, she shit herself. <laughs> yes. Same as when I done my Reiki course, I was telling you. I had the fucking top knot and a, my little certificate to say I was a Reiki master and people saying he's fucking worse now than he was when he was on the Charlie. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I actually thought maybe they're right. Maybe I was losing my shit, but... I just know how well my, my life is going now. I still battle, I still struggle, but I'm fucking smashing it yeah. mentally, spiritually. My eating needs to be under control, if I'm honest, but see when you're talking about all this stuff and travelling and the energies, you're just craving a little something. But I will I will get get it, and I've always said it. My weight goes up and down. People will see me on this podcast today, and then I'll be fucking 13 and a half stone in a month because I know I can lose it fast. I go extreme, yeah. water fast, and fucking fruit and veg, and, <laughs> and smash it, it. and then saying, I'll put on yeah. three stone at Christmas. Just this Christmas, I've never, <laughs> I never went on it. So I understand it, but what do you think about just the all and the, the misses? And do you think they should ever go, right, listen, you've got a family, yeah. but I don't need to be putting you in the fucking loony bin? Yeah. Because people do, they're concerned about what the shit you're talking about. No, no, my, my missus is awake now, a spiritually awake. Her, her journey has been incredible to see. Um, but she she is definitely, she, my mum and dad, I constantly get their opinion on things, constantly. And yeah, I like I said, I've always, for years, I, I watch what I said because exactly exactly what you've just said. But I think that time's over now. I need to to say exactly how I feel, and I'm not the people will say what they want to say. But a lot of that is is an agenda as well. Like the, the these are people designed to try and make me and Matt and other people look stupid and uh, try and ridicule us. That is designed, and then people get on top of that as well. So I, I like I said, I said to you before, since since a few weeks ago, I I don't care what other people are thinking of me. I, I've got to be true to myself, and if I feel the way I'm feeling, I've got to speak. I've got to say how I feel. My 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 wife has an opinion which I respect. My mum and dad have, have an opinion which I respect. My friends, everyone has an opinion, but I've got to be true to myself, and that's what I'm that's what I'm doing now. Yeah, because we only get one shot at this. Can you imagine fucking? disappearing and just never speaking how you truly feel end of the day it's only opinions it's only people's thoughts and people's words but i do say it quite frequently now look words are just as powerful and people's what we think how people see us is, is powerful as well because we all want to be liked but then it comes a stage where listen i've got to speak how i genuinely feel or else yeah. i'm going to go insane yes even though speaking out makes you fucking go insane it's you're never going to win basically <laughs> yeah. you're going we're going to what? go Obviously, what's difficult is that I'm becoming a coach. I want to try and put what I've learned to be a footballer to to to, to help other other kids, other other players. That's what I'm trying to do now. And I think football. I need football in my life. I've my love for football has come back. So knowing all that, what I've just said, no, and knowing I am going to carry on speaking out, it's going to be interesting for us all to see what happens do you think you'll be a target where people will try and say you can't be working with kids because of the shit that you're saying because you're not following suit and playing and dancing to their tune yes there's going to be all kinds of people saying all kinds of shit um, like I said I'm going to be true to myself um, I'm not going to push I'm not going to be saying anything to anyone this is my own personal life I'm speaking to you now because you knew I was going to be speaking like this but I, I when I'm at football I, I'm coaching football it's a job it's a job i'm very very good at it and i'm manifesting to be one of the best coaches in this country that this country has ever seen so i will i will be a success as a coach i know i will so what route that's going to be i don't know but we'll have to wait and see and find out i am enjoying my time at wigan it is unbelievable club unbelievable people the coaching staff are incredible to be around and i'm loving it at the minute so long may that continue yeah that's the thing football is a very glamorous career and people listen if you're keeping fit and healthy then the mindset's always going to work take its own path and staying on the right path and it's keeping kids away from the street and we get it like we say we can contradict ourselves because we know football is all <laughs> part of a game and the system but yeah it's if we can help kids give their mum and dad a better life retire their family and give their kids a better life then i would rather them do that than stuff in the streets rob banks sell drugs do bad shit do you know what I mean yes. but it's the yin and the yang it's the good and the bad where do you go forward for the future then 
None of them. So I'm manifesting my, my wife, myself, and my family to be unbelievable. I have the best life ever, healthy, incredible future. I'm hoping to be one of the best coaches this country's ever seen. And I'm trying to take down these globalists cunts as well for anybody that's watching it's maybe because i know this the, the transition is horrible it's a sticky kind of what the fuck is going on should i just stay drinking and taking drugs or should i be educating myself because the more you learn the more you earn and it's, it's a horrible place to be when you're in the middle of things and you, it's like a little spiritual war where you don't know who's telling the truth yeah. people are kind of stuck there what advice would you give for anybody that's on that kind of sticky road just now <sighs> so Definitely do not stop watching TV. Stop watching BBC. Stop watching ITV. Stop watching Sky. Stop watching that. Obviously, I'm not talking about sports. Sports amazing to, to 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 watch and stuff like that. But the news. This is propaganda. This this is the stages they want you to go through to get to where they're going. This is this what that's what the news is. This is propaganda. This is a script that they are telling you. So they are mind controlling you. Stop watching that as early as you can. Stop believing in it. Then start doing your own research. Start looking at the scientists who've been cancelled, the doctors who've been cancelled, and all the people who've been cancelled. Start researching them. Start looking at what they've said, why they got cancelled, and start making your own assumption once you've got all the information in. That's what I would say. Don't definitely do not take the mainstream media as your only source of news of what's going on in the world because I promise you, I promise you, it is not. It is completely the opposite. How's your daily routine like now? My, I, um, so f I coached Wigan uh, Tuesdays, Thursdays, uh, Monday, Tuesdays, Thursdays and, and play on the, then a game on a Saturday. So I evolved my family life around that, S simple as that. I've got businesses in um, all over the place, in, mostly in Liverpool, properties, bars, restaurants, um, that I don't spend much time in. I'm just mainly an investor in them. Um, and that's it really, mate. I spend time with my family, spend time with my friends. I want to become a full-time coach. I'm, I'm part-time at the minute, so I want to become a full-time coach and I want to become a manager. See that happening, everything? Yes. Everything, listen, everything you've manifested from a young age, you've ticked every box. What about for people who ridicules people for speaking out? What what would you say to them? People who, you're talking about energy and talking about the water and, listen, I get it. I, actually, when I done my Reiki course, it was Dr. Emoto's interpreter I worked with and she gave us a book, The Water Something, and I read it, I don't believe one. Then I watched the thing on YouTube. The woman was in like a subway station and she was taking photos of the crystals. And the words are powerful. Yes. As much as your thoughts are powerful, you can speak into existence a lot of things as well. And yes. if you're speaking shit all the time, I guarantee your life will be. If you're talking about depression and feeling sad all the time, you're going to be fucking sad. Yeah. You talk about happiness and making changes and positivity and gratitude and grateful for your life you're going to exactly feel all that as well. So I fucking get it. But for people who ridicule you or anybody who speaks out, I got it for years now. I think people just know, I don't give a fuck. I'm only speaking from what I know. I don't know everything, but this is just my journey. I'm not going to ridicule you for speaking different from me. I'll, I'll take it on board, even though you're wrong, but yeah. that's fine. So it's just for anybody that's ridiculing people now for trying to speak out, what would you say to them? Um, it's, it's, it's tough to give them advice. Um, what I would say is when Matt, when the opposition, when someone goes against the narrative like Matt has done, there's controlled opposition to it. So they try and ridicule him. So they put messages out. They put videos out. So when Matt puts a message out, there's, you go into the comments, it's like nutcase and, and stuff like that. Don't go off them comments. Listen to what Matt said. Let that be your judge of your character. Go go off what he's saying. Don't go off what the comments are saying, or what the memes are saying, or because some of them are funny. I've, I've, <laughs> some of them are very funny. Yeah. I've lost. I've laughed at a few of myself over the last week. <laughs> Don't go off them. Listen to what I'm saying. Listen to go what I'm saying, and then judge. Then judge. Am I talking shit? 
am I going nuts or does any of it resonate with you and then make a decision because they're going to be questioning what's in the water at fucking Southampton man they used to <laughs> they'll start to be investigating maybe it's something with Southampton's training or they fucking brainwashing those kids you're talking about brainwashing but the dressing room must be everybody sitting with fucking tinfoil hats on it's mad they'll be start honestly they'll be questioning what the fuck two of the fucking greatest yeah. all time goal scorers for Southampton are talking pure shit they'll be saying but then the bottom line is I believe everything and stand everything that you guys are doing and I'll always be at the forefront as well and doing my thing what I can but I'll always stay I might get it wrong sometimes as well yeah. I might get it wrong I'm not a scientist I'm not a doctor but just with the information there I just listen just don't be fooled too much yeah. life can be a beautiful place you don't need to live in that program in the situation where it's all fucked yeah. up yeah no you're in an unbelievable place in life because you're coming across two sides you're you're seeing the full spectrum yeah. so not many people see that and i'm not you're it's kind of playing it safe as well but I, I genuinely don't have all the answers i'm no. not a doctor i'm not a scientist i do genuinely believe there's a shift i believe the world is run by wicked people i believe in all the fucking the human trafficking and children going missing and it's you can go down the route of fucking just mad dark stuff you can go right down the rabbit hole but again you go keep going down that as well you forgetting to live my kids yes. need me my family need me i've got yes. to kind of find some sort of balance investigate some sort of stuff watch a youtube video doesn't make, make me a professional or a professor it makes me just question it and go hmm is that intriguing or does it just feel sexy to to be going against the governments i've always been that way anyway yeah. but just you got to question everything and not go with what everybody's saying you me matt but just go maybe they're on to something and then maybe look into it yourself and That's then it have your own mindset yeah. do you know what i mean because everybody in the world is confused we're all looking for answers but there's other people who just live their life and not give a fuck yeah they do their surfing or sit in the beach i envy them yeah i, I thought about <laughs> seriously I moving into them. the wilderness <laughs> buying a hut growing my pubes growing the hair <laughs> just growing my own fruit and veg having my dogs and just fucking living that life yeah. but then i thought I would be fucking suicidal after a few days. I need to be in the mix. I need to be causing trouble somewhere. So it's yeah. it's like a contradiction that we spoke about. I thought about just leaving this game. I don't want social media, yeah. but then I thrive on it because people tell me how amazing I'm doing. <laughs> but then on the other hand, I need to switch my... So it's a constant battle. But you know what? As long as you're getting up every day and, and not being a cunt and being a good person and trying to do the right thing and being a good dad and we speak about being alpha and masculine, the most alpha thing you can do is look after your family. Yes. Everything else is just a bonus after that. Yeah, That's I what I believe. Agree. I mean, I couldn't have said it better. I was spot on, spot on. And I'm trying to make sure that my mind is on my kids and my family and that's that's yeah. that's, that's the most important thing in my in my life because this shit can affect the kids at schools and it can affect all the yes. other shit with people teasing them and, and that can fuck them up yes. in life. So like I say, it's not a play safe, but it's just have balance. I'm Take everybody's yes. opinions on. Do you know what I mean? You Constantly, need... yeah. Fifth part is fifteen. He he, uh, he he's the. So when I do a video or I say I tell him like this is what I've done, this is what I'm saying, mm. this is the type of response I'm gonna get, and this is the type of bad response. So you might hear some, but he's like I said, he lived through that period of me playing for Liverpool, and I'm failing. That was tough for him. That was tough. So even to this day, like your dad's shit. Your dad was shit at Liverpool. He, did, he only scored this amount of goals and stuff like that. He, he, he still gets that. It's just water off a duck's back for him now. He's, I look at him now and I'm so proud of him. Shit he's gone through. It's, it's, it's amazing to see the type of character he is um, and the type of man he's going to be. It's, in, it's incredible. So I, I totally understand what you're saying. And that is my first and foremost yeah, of course. course. Yeah, Ricky boy, would you like to finish up? Finish up on anything? What's your social media and stuff for people to kind of ask questions and get involved? <laughs> yeah, no, my uh, I'm on Instagram and Twitter now. Obviously, um, Instagram is Lambo Seven. Uh, my Twitter is Saint Lambo Seven. And I would just yeah, I would just say there's a movement going out. Uh, started last Friday. Uh, I do not consent. We are sending letters to our local MPs uh, and the Prime Minister saying that we do not consent of what you have done. We can see you. Um, you have been compromised. And we, we want you out. We're sending that to our local MPs as well. Uh, we're sending a message out and it's, getting, it's, getting, it's going worldwide. 
another message is going out tonight which is friday i'm not sure when this is going out um just watch watch for that watch for that yeah. it's it's going to be building we need people we need people to back it we need people to change their uh profile picture who believe in it start start following us get on board I've, you've just heard what it's about everything that i've been saying hopefully it resonates with you please get on board and follow us ricky boy listen phenomenal career you should be proud of everything you're achieving and like i said everything you're speaking out against i back as well so it's not easy doing all this shit but somebody's got to do it it's just conversations people can get what they want out of it but fair play for you for kicking on with your career getting an england call up it's going against scotland bastard <laughs> but it's, uh, unbelievable and you should be proud i know your kids will be proud and everything you're doing so fair play i wish you all the best for the future and i look forward to seeing what you do next nice one God mate. Bless Thank you. My brother. nice one Thank James. You.